Welcome back. Um, we're still doing the, the study of the book of Judges. Today we're uh, beginning with chapter 3. If you missed anything, uh, feel free to go back through and uh, pick up any of the videos that we made before. Or, uh, you know, just uh, study the book yourself. It, it's an interesting book. Um, well, without any further ado, no, no lead-ups, no intros, no nothing. Let's just jump right into it. Judges chapter 3. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, it says, okay, Judges chapter 3, verse 1. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars of Canaan. Now, you'll notice verse 2 is in parentheses in your new King James. King James, it's not uh, parenthesized. We'll get back to that later. Verse 2 says, this was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Okay, now, end parentheses, begin verse 3. Namely, the five lords of the Philistines, all the Can uh, Canaanites, <laughs> the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them, to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. <sighs> Tragic. Again, uh, this is chapter 3. The first two chapters, I made a very big deal about uh, the correlation or the similarities, if you will, between uh, you know, Old Testament Israel and New Testament uh, America, if you will, or more specifically, the church. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. I'm not going to do that. However, that, that, that premise, that, that theory, that thread follows all through the book of Judges. So just keep that in your mind as, as we read. Um, you know, Judges chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, to me, and you know, these are all just my observations, and, and if any, anything sounds weird, then judge me. Don't judge the Bible. This is just, you know, um, I'm expounding, if you will. A, a lot of people do. <laughs> uh, this is my take. I think a little weird, but like I said, to me, Judges chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it's an extension of chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And if you're with us the last time, in that section, in that little uh, part, we, we looked at uh, two things between uh, Judges chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. We looked at two things specifically, uh, God's righteous yet variable judgments. If you were with us for that study, I hope that still is, is in your head. We also looked at uh, why do bad things happen to good people. It's a very interesting concept. It, it's an interesting thought. And if you were with us, I hope that sticks with you. If not, it... it it might serve you well to go back and look at that because it plays all throughout the book. However, like I said, you know, chapter uh, 3, verses 1 and 2, it, it's an extension of that. Um, I look at it like this. You know, God is our Heavenly Father. We already discussed the difference between Israel and the church, and I'm not going to harp on that, but either way you look at it, you know, God is our Heavenly Father. And, and as a father, he's, he's raising up his children, if you will. Um, and the best way to do that is, is to, to teach them, to, to, to study, you know, to, to, to make them think for themselves and to use common sense, uh, to, to use their surroundings. Uh, you know, facts and, and, and figures play prominently uh, in, in study and in, in growing and learning. And God's using these nations in much the same way. It's also in a way to, uh, you know, as a father raising a son, you want to teach him to, to stand up to bullets. There's many different ways to do that. Um, and as we're going through the book of Judges, I, I'm sure that, that that will all play out. But also you have to, you know, you look at it like uh, trust and trials. God left these nations there. For a reason, if you remember from our studies, you know why this happened. Israel pretty much brought it upon themselves. Kind of like a father, you know, with a toddler um, in the kitchen. Let's just say that, for instance, uh, you know, don't touch the stove, it's hot. 
Every time he goes by the stove and it's on, you say, don't touch, hot, hot, hot. And the kid, you know, doesn't really understand what hot is until he touches it himself. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't play with fire, you're going to get burned, if you will. But sometimes experience is the best teacher. I could tell you don't touch a stove, it's hot until I'm blue in the face, but until you understand what hot really does, and basically that, that's what we see here. Um, the Lord's leading these nations for many variable reasons, and one's just, you know, in a way, don't touch, hot, okay, you're going to keep, here, burn yourself, and then you'll find out. Yeah. Of course, this is just my thoughts, this is my uh, take on it. it, it's just, it's, it's just something to think about, really. And you know me, I, I'm, I'm a little weird. When I'm looking at verse 2, it's in parentheses. And and to me, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, it's a secret knowledge, if you will. It, it's imparted wisdom. It, it's a, well, I'm telling you why, and now you know, I'm telling you what. And then basically verse 2 is, is here's why I'm telling you what. This is the why for the what. Um, it, it, it's, to me, it, it, it's like a revealing, you know, like a revelation or an insight. Can I say it, it's, a, it's a gift of wisdom? Look at those parentheses as like a gift of God saying, here, this is what that means. Because a lot of times people, when they just read over the Bible too quickly, they just, you know, they don't understand. They, they lose out on a lot of things. And God takes the time, by way of these parentheses, is to make us, you know, well, here. Am, am I weird? Yes, I am. Um, Judges 2, verses, uh, excuse me, 3. Whoa, where am I? Judges 3, verse 3. And it's, this is after the parentheses. This is the why for the what. And it says, these, Namely, he left the five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites. Um, you know, I have a list of 23 nations that, that in, in biblical... Um, history, not so much in modern history, but in biblically, biblical history, here's a list of 23 nations that, that fought against Israel. you got your Philistines, the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Assyrians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, uh, the Jebusites, Moabites, Ammonites, Amalekites, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, the Mayanites, <laughs> um, Edomites, Arabians, Egyptians, uh, did I say Grecians already? Um, how about the Romans? In biblical history, these are all, this is just 23 of the nations that we see that come up against Israel. And that, that's not to mention modern history. Watch the news today. How many people groups, how many nations, how many tribesmen are, are coming against Israel? Interesting. Well, as I say interesting, it was interesting to me that the Lord specifically named five nations, people groups. Remembering first that they were to be conquered. All these 23 nations and, and more in biblical terminology in, in in history we see that coming into the promised land God said you know in Deuteron Genesis Deuteronomy Exodus saying you know I want you to take care of these people you do not are supposed to, you're not supposed to be with them drive them out or utterly destroy them either way he did not want them to commingle to cohabitate um, you know it's like oil and water uh, <laughs> oil and vinegar it won't mix so God knows this, you know, he knows the, the, the past and the beginning as is, is, is if, you know, it's nothing, you know, to God. So his ways are best. We don't always have to understand it. Like a father with a toddler, the toddler doesn't know what hot means, but the father knows best. He doesn't want his son to get burnt. That's why God told the Israelites in, in earlier times in uh, Genesis, Exodus, you know, Deuteronomy, you know, and, and so on and so forth. We looked at these in the, in the weeks prior. It was all for their good. Remember that, okay? That all these 23 nations, and namely these five lords of the Philistines, were to be conquered, to be destroyed. At the very least, to be subjugated. 
but just like the two-year-old, um, Israel wouldn't listen. So, in this people, okay, you got the five lords of the Philistines. Okay, these are, let's just look at it this way, five cities that are all like Philistinian, okay? Now, the, the, the word Philistines, for those who, who like to study and for those who have a strong concordance, Philistines, the reference number in your Hebrew and Aramaic is um, 6430. I did the word studies for you, um, and, and I was very blessed by it, and I, I hope to impart some of these things that I've learned. So I, I looked up the Philistines, right? And from your Hebrew Aramaic, it, it comes from the word, uh, and I'm probably going to torture the pronunciation, palas. Um, and it basically just means to roll oneself in, you know, like in dust or ashes, to, to roll in, or it, to, to wallow. Um, it, 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 just an example, you know, palas means rolling, like to, to roll about in or to give oneself over to, uh, to, to revel in, you know, like a feeling or, or a way of life, you know, um, it even can, can you know, like to wallow in self-pity, palas, Palestine means to, to wallow, to roll oneself in, to, to, to be wrapped up in. Uh, you can you can wallow in self-pity. You can also wallow in, in riches. But, but at, at, the, at, at the core, at, at the bottom of it, it's all about self, right? Self, wallow in all these, uh, you know, like self-importance, uh, self-pity, self-indulgence, self-pleasure. Or even self-depreciation, the, the Palestine, the, your word study, you know, the, and again, as I said a lot of times, you know, the book of Judges is for our example, it, it, it's for, uh, you know, a warning, it's also for an encouragement, and, and, and it's for reference, it's, it's to study. And as we do a word study, Philistine means to roll oneself in, and you can roll yourself up in anything. Self-pity, self-importance, and so on and so forth. Self-delusions. When you look at all these nations that, that Mizra came up against, do a word study. We're going to be doing that today, and I, and I hope it takes root. I, I hope you, I'm not really spiritualizing, but I, I'm digging in. I'm not just going to read over this quickly, and, and hopefully I can learn something by this, and hopefully you, you may as well. The book of Judges is more than just uh, the history of Israel. Yes, it's history. It's not allegory. But if you, I don't like to, to use the word spiritualize, let's just say if we apply what we read to our, our modern day living, there's a lot here that we can look at. So, the Lord left one of the nations, and, and you notice there's five lords of the Philistines. Back then it was five cities. But if you look at it, I, I mentioned self-importance, self-pity, self-indulgence, self-pleasure, self-depreciation. It's like, oh, I don't matter. You know, woe is me. Who am I? Self-depreciation to, to lower yourself. Not only can we lift ourselves, but lower ourselves. Anything that does, deals with self, there's your Philistine. And you notice that in, in, in uh, Israel's history, of all of Israel's enemies, the Philistines were the most contentious. Just like today. Aren't we all our own worst enemies? I can do me a lot worse than you can do me. You know what I mean? I, I, can, I can make myself you know, more poorer than, than you know, <laughs> I can make myself more richer. I, it's all about self. We're, we, we can either be the best thing for ourselves, which ultimately will be our doom, or we can be the, the worst thing for us, which is, in, in a way, in, in Christianity, you know, you gotta, you got to do away with self. You've know, you got to humble yourself to be lifted in the sight of the Lord. That's a, a sermon for another point. But you see, the Philistines were left to test Israel. Number one, chiefly among them were the Philistines. you got the five lords. So you got five self-habits. I embellish, <laughs> but I, I hope you get the point, all right? Judges is a lot deeper than we give it credit for. When you look at the Canaanites, 
in your Strong's Concordance, uh, your reference for your Hebrew Aramean, Hebrew Aramic uh, translation for the word Canaanites, your number is 3669. You can flip right to the back to your Hebrew Aramic section, look up uh, number 3669, and you'll see that the word Canaanites, and I'm going to torture this again, comes from the Hebrew Aramic word Kanani. I might have said that right. But it means it, it means merchant or merchants or, or merchandising. Um, Kanani. Merchants, you know, buying, selling. Um, example for merchants, and of course this is a no-brainer. You got your peddling, you got your brokering, profiteering, exerting influence with, with bribe or with conspiracy is merchanting. It, it, it's Kanani, it's Canaanites. Also, corruption. <laughs> the love of money is the root of all types of evil. And money is the, you know, you couldn't have merchant, you couldn't be buying and selling without money. So, the Lord left these five nations. And it is weird, okay, I, I, I you know, just stick with me. I, I hope there, we'll, we'll tie this all together here later. Um, but to me, Canaanites, merchants, merchandising, um, your modern day Philistines and Canaanites are, are easily drawn toward the prosperity gospel. Look at your church today, Canaanites everywhere. You know, you, you can't swing a cat without hitting someone who's buying or selling something in, in the name of religion. I say this a thousand times, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a true and living God. All these pagan deities, these were all self-made. Again, going back to point number one, which were the Philistines, you know, self. I don't like what, you know, what God's telling me, so I'm going to make my own God. I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to make my own religions. You know, Philistines, they're everywhere, you know. Even in the guise of Christianity. You know, books like the Prayer of Jabez, Canaanites. Or, you can have your best life now, Canaanites. Uh, I'm passionate but I, I don't mean to judge. I'm just discerning. I, I, I like to think that if I'm going to make a fool out of myself, I could do that by my own. I don't need your help. I don't need you to have your best life now. I don't need your prayer of Jabez. I don't need this prosperity stuff because the, the, the love of money is the root of all types of evil. And, you know, even the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, again, I'm, I'm wandering. There's just so many rabbit trails that we could take from these word studies. Philistines, Canaanites, you got your self-important people in, in, in all walks of life, in all avenues of, of daily living. Selfish, selfishness is rampant in American culture. So why would it be any different that it's in American churches? Canaanites, buying and selling. Automatically, and it's not even in my notes, but I'm thinking of when Jesus came in, you know, he came to the temple, and what did he see? You know, merchants. <laughs> you know, they're ripping people off. You know, they're selling, you know, like two turtle doves for, for, uh, for the, you know, the, the daily sacrifices and stuff that was still going on back then. They made a mockery of it. They, they made a sham. They made a killing, you know, with, with the, the monetary rate of exchange, you know, for... They were charging like $50 for a, a, a $2 item. It was crazy. Canaanites. Merchandising. Christianity. Go to a Christian bookstore. Canaanites. I'm not saying Christian bookstores are bad. However, merchandising. So the Lord left these nations that he might test Israel. Number three were the Hittites. Your Hebrew Aramaic reference number would be 2850, and, and and basically it comes from you know it just means Hitty or descendants of Heth. Now you, you look up the Hittites in the Bible and you'll find thousands of reference of Hittites, but they're all descendants uh, of Heth. Now all these nations that we're looking at today, remember they're all Canaanites, and you remember who the Canaanites are from uh, Genesis 9:25. 
you know, Noah and his three sons, um, Ham, he pretty much dissed his dad. So Noah pretty, pretty much put a curse on, on, on not Ham himself, but on, on his sons, on Canaan. Interesting study in its own right, but however, biblically speaking, when you look at the Canaanites, the Canaanites, there, there is a, a prophecy against them, a curse, if you will, in Genesis 9.25. Remember that as we go through all out the book of Judges. You know, you got your Philistines, your Canaanites, uh, the Hittites, all descendants from Ham, all, you know, direct descendants from Canaan himself, Canaan, whoever. But, okay, so Hitty was, uh, it was actually, I believe, I think this was uh, Canaan's firstborn, if I'm not mistaken. It's not in my notes, but if I remember from my studies, uh, I'm pretty sure Heth was Canaan's firstborn. When you look up Canaanites in Scripture, there's thousands of references to Hittites, but only 19 to Heth, and I read them all. And, well, no, not 19, excuse me, there was 14 mentions in Scripture of Heth. And most of them, they were all innocuous except for one point, but most, 13 of the 14 references was dealing with death. Um, if you look at the death of Sarah in, in Israel's history, if you look at the death of Jacob, that's when Heth became prominent. That's when when he was mentioned. That's when he had his hands and that's what he's part and privy to. You read those, you look up Heth in, in, in the Bible and do a word study on that, it's, it's, it's interesting. But for me, just the way I look at it, and I hope it makes sense to you, perhaps, even from the most humblest beginnings of the sons of Heth, uh, the sons of Heth would live up to their name. And and, and Heth <laughs> means sons of terror. Hittites means sons of Heth. And the, and, and the word Heth, and I don't know why I didn't write down the, the, the reference number. Oh, yes, I did. Didn't I? 2850, sons of Heth. Heth means sons of terror. You don't really see that when you look at these 14 references of Scripture until you come upon Genesis 27. And I'm going to read that quickly to you. I should read the whole thing in content and context because boys and girls, it's very important. Always keep things in content in context. If I were to do so, I would read uh, verses 38 through 46, but I'm already running out of time. So I'm just going to read Genesis 27, uh, verse 46, if I can find that quickly. And again, this is... Please read verses 38 through 46. Verse 46 itself says, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? I feel a certain coming on. Read this for yourself. And, and you can see, uh, I'm going to try just to touch on this quickly. If I had the time, believe me, we could spend all day here. You look at uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau was, was like the wild man. Jacob was like the homeboy. You know, he was like a mama's boy, and, and Jacob was a mighty hunter, blah, blah, blah. Je you know, Esau lived off the land, and, and he married into, he, he, he hung out with, he associated, he mingled with, he was a party to, and, and part of, the sons of Heth, the, the, the descendants in the land, sons of terror, and it's a very interesting, long, drawn-up study. It's just very interesting to me. You see a lot of that in the church today, and uh, I'll try not to preach, um, but I hope you can see it. There, there, there is a sermon into its own self here, but. Looking at the Hittites, the sons of Heth, the Hittites are, are your modern-day Turkey. Um, back in, in biblical times, they were the largest ancient empire. They were a strong and violent people, and they still are to this day. Back then, as as of now, you'll see, um, you know, it's not, uh, what is it? It used to be um, Alexander, now Alexandria, now it's Istanbul. Um, there are some people that that's 
don't get me going. There's another rabbit trail. But half the Hittites, they, 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 they were violent. They were ruthless. And they ruled by fear and intimidation. That's, that's important here for our purposes today. Fear and intimidation. To subjugate by any means possible. Dare I say a lot of Christians today are subjugated by fear and intimidation. Political correctness is the tool of the day to instill fear and, and, and subjugation and intimidation. Much like these five nations were, were testing Israel, a lot of things are testing us today. And we'll get to the reason to the test in, in, in momentarily here. We already looked at it when we read the first six verses. But you and I today, much like Israel back in, in the days of Judges, we're being tested, we're being tried to see what manner of, of man we are, what manner of woman we are, what manner of Christian are we? Are we one at all? Do we claim the name of Jesus and don't follow his precepts? Are, are, we, are we bullied into silence? Another long rabbit trail. And I, I can't believe I'm getting off my notes so so widely here, but think about these for your own self. Do a word studies, come back and, and, and ponder these. I mean, ponder upon them, if you will. Because a lot of people just read their Bible quickly and don't get nothing out of it. I hope that when we slow down and we just look at these things, I hope maybe, hopefully, you're getting something out of it. Um, of these five nations that, that were left, there was 20... Three that came up against Israel. We're only looking at five. I invite you to look at all these nations. But the Sidonians, your Hebrew Aramaic uh, reference number is 6722 in your Strong's Concordance. It, it, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong too. Sidoni? 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 I'm, I'm torturing it. I, I apologize. There's a bunch of symbols and, and stuff over your I and your O and and your other I. Uh, so I don't really know how to. I, I don't get into you know the, the phonics of you know what how to pronounce it. If I if I took the time, I probably could do that and, and pronounce it right for you. But in translation, nothing is lost. It it it, it simply means you know. Sidonians is uh, Hebrew Aramaic for Sodine, Sodine, or just basically means Sidonian people. Um, and you look up the word Sidon, and it means fishery. <laughs> or a, a, another translation is, is with it, instead of an S, say Z, Zidon, Z, Zidon, or Zidon, or whatever. And, and that word, however you pronounce it, means fortify. Fishery and fortification. Oh, wait, okay. So this guy was your firstborn of, Can uh, of Canaan, uh, son of Ham. Okay, so I wrote that down in my notes after all. I was just the wrong person. Um, Sidon um, was Canaan's firstborn. And remember, Noah's curse fell upon Canaan. And isn't it fun? You know, the curse was, uh, you know, to loose paraphrase, you know, servant of servants you shall be. In modern vernacular, you're going to be a slave. You're going to serve your other. You're going to you're going to you know be the lesser of. You're always going to serve the one stronger than you. And you look at modern day Sidon or Sidonians. Um, it's a very interesting study. I, I took it like a day to do this. I'm just giving you bits and pieces. But if you want to, you can go to uh, BibleHistory.com and and you type in uh, Sidonians and Here's what you get. Sidonians is also known as the Phoenicians in, in biblical history in, in uh, ancient times. Uh, the Sidonians were also known as the Phoenicians. In, in times past, they had two different capitals at different periods of time, of course. Um, and those, uh, those capitals were both Tyre, or Tyre and Sidon which are both still cities to this day. I, I looked it up. A very beautiful city. Very ancient. Very stoic. It's beautiful. It's rustic. It's, uh, Sidon is a coastal city off of the Mediterranean, 25 miles north of Tyre, or Tyre, um, back in, in 
ancient times, it was the first city to send ships upon the open seas. To me, just the way I think, I automatically remember who? Jonah. Where did he, when he was running away from God, where did he go? Tarshish, right? He was supposed to go to Tarshish. He ended up trying to run away. No, he was, but anyways, the long story of it, I remember Jonah. He went to these, this area and, and, and took the first boat out of town. Um, so there's a lot of history. Sidon, in and of itself, was a wealthy commercial city, famous for their gold, silver, embroideries, the dyes, metals, but especially glass. Why that is? Interesting. An ancient proverb of, of the day, it, it just, he, he, just so you can get a, a pulse on, 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 a finger on the pulse of the people of Sidon, there was an ancient proverb that said, dwell clear, excuse me, and I'm going to quote, says, dwell carelessly after the manner of the Sidonians. They had it made. They, they, their city was beautiful. They, they lived off the sea. Uh, they had an easy life, um, a very prosperous life, but, you know, that's their history. An also interesting part of their history was Jezebel. Jezebel, if anybody is a student of their Bible, knows that Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, and she was the daughter of the king of Sidon. And it was Jezebel who had introduced certain new cults into Israel. Life of luxury. Uh, affluence, you know, affluenza. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they didn't have a care in the world and, and they thought of a whole bunch of manner of false teaching. Much like our church today, there's false teaching everywhere. You can't... Yeah. While we're studying the, the, the book of Judges, there's so much here. When you look at the Sidonians, which are one of the five nations left to test Israel, you look at, at false teachers. People who, who who have an air of you know you know you know life is easy type of thing. You can have your best life now, whatever. Um, I have so much up here that's not coming out here that because I don't want to seem judgmental. But when you do the study yourself, you can see there's a there's a there's a a dire warning here. In the study of Judges, just by looking at it, only five of these named nations that were left to test Israel. And you either get things, funny thing about tests, there's only two outcomes. You're either going to pass or you're going to fail. I'm hoping that most of us pass. I'm afraid that many of us fail. Because we don't, we try to take the easy way out of everything. We lose a lot in, in translation. We don't even study at all. Not in my notes, but someone once said that Christianity is, is like an overcooked noodle. You know, people are just limp and, and they lack... Uh, I don't know, whatever. Anything, basically, <laughs> the bottom line here from your test of the Sidonians, anything new in Christianity. Anything that smells fishy, you well, get that? You can bet it's of Sidonian nature, if you will. It's fishy. It's false teachers. Sidonian false teachers. The Hivites um, mentioned in these five nations that were left to test Israel. Your Hebrew Aramaic reference number would be 2340. Um, Hivites in, in, in the Hebrew tongue or the Aramic tongue is Hiwi H-I-W-W-I -W -W -I, Hiwi, <laughs> whatever and it means a, a villager um, the descendants of Ham excuse me, the descendants of Ham a Canaanite uh, the Hivites were again they're all Canaanites, they're all descendants of Ham, they all have the same curse or connotation or prophecy, whatever you want to look at it, they all bear the same thing here. And as a, as a Hivites or a Hiwi, your first mention can be found in Genesis 10 verses 15 through 20. 
I'm going to run out of time, but I should just run back there quickly and look at that with you, because it's your first mention. There's a law of first reference. There's a law of double reference. When you, but when you, I love Bible study. I don't want to get into the particulars, but Genesis 10, verses 15 through 20. Um, oh, look at this. It says, Canaan. It's talking about um, Can Canaan, the son of Ham, the guy who had a curse on him. Here, here's his kids, okay? Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Heth would have been his secondborn, I guess. And then these are all people groups that, that came out of, of future uh, sons in his lineage. And their, their people groups are nations known as the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gig, the Gergesite, <laughs> the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite. The Arvidite, the Zemina, Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the family of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites were, was from Sidon, hmm, as you go towards Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zebulun, as far as Lasha. These were the sons of, of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Again, that's uh, Genesis 10, verses 15 through 20. Uh, people just read their Bible too quickly. They, they don't think. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of importance about, you know, topography, geography. You know that their uh, the, the geology. Well, what's it called when you the study of your um, ancestry, whatever the word is. You know what I'm trying to say. The Hivites come. It's Hebrew, Aramaic, Hiwi, which and, and basically the name means villager. And a lot of things about you know na names that people had back those back in those days, it kind of depicted what type of person they were. Just like Native Americans, they didn't name their children until they saw one of their first actions, like uh, you know, running bear, <laughs> whatever. After the kid was born, they looked out and they saw a running bear. So therefore, back ancient times, uh, Hebrew times, words and names had meanings. It had and it played out in their lives. It's fascinating. Um, what's your name? Look up your name and, and what it means, and then, then just you know, just test that to see if it still rings true today. My name is Michael. It's interesting, um, and I, 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 I hope I live up to it. I haven't yet. He, uh, who is like the Lord? That's what Michael means. Anyways, off my notes again. Anyways, okay. So when you when you look at your Hivites or your Hiwiites, whatever. That they're almost always, when you look at them in Scripture, they are almost always included with the mention of the Perizzites and the Jebusites. They're all brothers. They're all you know nieces and nephews, and they're all part of the same family. But interesting that you can never find them mentioned apart. So I did word studies on the other names. And the Jebusites, your reference number for your Hebrew Aramaic text is 2983 in your Strong's Concordance. And I'm going to torture your name. Jebusites come from your Hebrew ye, Yebusi, <laughs> Yebusi, Yebusi, or or Je, Jebus. Um, your Jebusites are, are sons of, of Jebus, or Yebusi, <laughs> Yebusi, whatever. And it means simply, it, <laughs> I'm torturing the name, it means to trample or to tread down. Your Jebusites are people that keep it under their thumb, you know, walk all over you, take advantage of you. How many Jebusites have you seen in church today? And I don't see that, you know, uh, as, as a compliment. Per Perizites. Per Perizites. I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. But your, you know, your reference number for your Strong's Concordance is 6522. And it comes from the word, the Hebrew word, Perizzi. And that's pretty close. And and basically that name, Perizzi, means rustic or belonging to a village. Let's just say one of the crowd. So you got your Hivites, villager, in a village, of the village, part of the village, you know, in and of. And also, you know, to trans. You know, the funny thing about, you know, Stampedes. You can never have a one-person stampede. It's always a bunch of people, right? 
How many people died in a stampede by, you know, two or three people? No, it's always in a large gathering. How many megachurches do we have in America alone today? Filled with Hivites and Jebusites and Perizzites. I used to belong to one, and the people in the midst are, are wow, bitter, angry. Uh, they, they talk about, you know, they, they smile at your face and stab you in the back, all in the name of Christianity, which is no surprise to me. We have so many atheists today. Some of my best friends, and I hope maybe one or two of them are watching this, are, are antagonists. They, you know, they argue against Christianity because they watch and they see how we're acting. And we're acting just like these nations that were left to test Israel. We are failing the test, and, and in the name of Jesus is being drawn to the mud because of the way we act. Christian, I say this to your shame. We're being tested and we're failing. No wonder why people are, are, are leaving the churches in droves and why atheism is rampant and, and, and why false Christianity, I mean, Christianity in, in, to, in America today is a hundred miles wide and a half an inch deep. There's no depth, there's no root, there's no real... So, getting back to my notes, I wrote in the, in the margin here, it says, all have their own interesting, if not disturbing history, separate and apart of, an, of one another, and they do. I did the study, I did the research. The Hivites, ugh. the Jebusites, even worse. The Perizzites, they weren't so great either, but they weren't so bad by, by comparison, but, you know, the lesser of two evils is still evil. A lot of... Yeah. I don't want to seem like I'm coming down on the church. I'm not anti-Christian. I'm not anti-religion. I'm pro-God. I'm pro-Jesus. And God and Jesus are not allowed in the churches today. Why? Why? Because of the Canaanites, the Philistines, the, the, the Hittites, the Sidonians, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites. But when you look at these three people groups together, back to my notes, sorry. The Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, all these three together, separate, they're, they're unique. Together, perhaps we may infer, looking at all these in and of themselves and together collectively, I see a false humility. But you see more false humility in church today, then it makes me sick. It makes me sick. A desire to fit in, you know, the villager mentality. I, I, I want to be a Hivite. I want to fit in. I don't want to stand apart. I want to be a part of the crowd. <laughs> I wrote this down because all these things are just my funny way of thinking. It's not dogmatic. I, I, I go to a Calvary Chapel church, but I don't really hear this being taught in the Calvary Chapel church. This is just me. Don't blame Calvary Chapel. Don't blame the Bible. Don't blame Jesus if you're going to blame anybody. If you want to thank anybody, thank God. Thank the Holy Spirit. It's not me, okay? But, but what I see here in these three people groups, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, are people who are purposely ignorant. Church, church, come on, wake up. You are being stupid on purpose. You throw your brains in a, in a trash can so you can follow, you know, all these false healers and, 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 and false prophets and prophetesses and, and so on and so forth. You know, oh, mm, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I see people, people in these three people groups, I see people who are willingly misled. They know it's wrong, but just to fit in, just to have friends, to be part of the crowd, I'll allow myself to be willingly misled. In my own funny way of thinking, I also see people who, who are being insecure. Your modern-day Hivites. Your modern-day Perizzites. Or you, not so much the Jebusites, but maybe so. Are people who are insecure. Submissive. Complacent. Apathetic. People who are never willing to stake a claim or to make a stand. People who, who bow to be who try to be, who ex you know, aspire to be politically correct, because that's the, the you know the thing of the day. 
Or, or the same coin, but the flip side of the same coin is you have the people who self-depreciate themselves. Oh, God can never use a person like me. I can't make a difference. Well, God can't use me. All these nations were left to test Israel. All these things that we're talking about are, are, are personalities, are, are, are mindsets, are, are worldviews that are steep in Christianity today. And without, you look at the Bible, there, there's no room for it. None. None whatsoever. When I look at all these, these nations that were left to test Israel, my mind immediately flashed to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I hope this sounds familiar to at least one or two of you. And I'm going to read it from the New King James uh, Version again. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, for, for although we live in the world, we do not war according to the flesh. We, we don't, you know, we don't fight like the world. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Listen, for the pulling down the strongholds. For the pulling down of, of worldviews or opinions. To cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You don't see that very much in the church today. Believe me, I can preach on this for 15 years. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5. It's lost on a large body of, of, of the church today. But what I hope we can learn from our study in the book of Judges is to, be, is, is, is to spiritually apply the physical lessons that Old Testament Israel represents. The Hivites, villager, you know, uh, to be one, uh, to be part of the crowd, to fit in, to be politically correct. Your Jebusites, to trample or to tread down, to, to, to you know, to, to be a bully, to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, the Bible also says. I can go on. I could be here all day, and I'm already out of time. Okay, well, I'm already out of time. I got a couple minutes. Let, let's, let's get back and, and finish, uh, you know, Judges chapter 3. Let's read verses 4 through 6. It, it, again, these five nations were left to test Israel. And we named them all. Now, verse 4. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded to their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of the Lord dwelt, excuse me, thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Notice that the children of the Israel dwelt among them, not vice versa. Wow. I wish I had time. To me, just the way I think, I, I draw outside the lines, I color outside of the, the boxes, you know, I, I no apologies. The spiritual application of these verses in view of our study today is frighteningly evident. Israel dwelt, dwelt among the nations. The church is part of the world. We're not holy. The Bible says to be ye holy as I am holy. And we you can't tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Israel had a point and a purpose for their existence in Old Testament times. Just like in New Testament times, the church has a point and a purpose. We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be an example, a light in the darkness, if you will. Just like Israel, the church, you, Christian, me, Christian, dropped the ball. We're politically correct. We've been bullied. We've been... Ugh. I just want to look at this and then we'll close. I'm already out of time. I can't believe how time gets away from us. When I look at all this, I automatically, here's your homework. I want you to really read, not just read over quickly, but to go through it verse by verse and contemplate 1 Samuel chapter 15. It has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. But I only got so much time. I just want to look at 1 Samuel 15 verses 22 
to the first part of, of verse 23. Again, everything in content and context. That's why I want you to read the chapter for yourself. And think about what we just talked about today as you read that. Study it, okay? 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's a rhetorical question. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, and it goes on. Today, Christianity rejects the word of the Lord. Today, the church is so stiff-hearted and rebellious, and, and, and we think we can approach God in our religion. But the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. To have a relationship is better than having a religion. That's lost. Is it any wonder why we have so many people who are, are flocking to... You know how many uh, churches of Satan are springing up in America? How many uh, Islamic mosques are springing up in America? And how many people are running to, to gods of their own making? You know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever. You know, there's there's so many things out there that we, re, we replace the word with. We replace a relationship with God. And we just make a... Uh, I, I, I don't apologize. I just have so much up in here that I wasn't able to get out here because I'm already out of time. Um... I just want you all to continue in your study of the, of the book of Judges. We just looked at Judges chapter 3 today, verses 1 through 6. And I hope, for, for your sake as well as mine, that, that we maybe looked at this familiar passage in a different way. That perhaps we're starting to realize how far we've come and how we need to get back to the principles, to the basics, to the rudimentaries, if you will, you know? <laughs> That's how I know we're in the last days. Because the Bible says that that day will not come, which is, let's just say, the next chapter in the history of mankind, will not come until the falling away comes first. That's New Testament application to what we already can see in the Old Testament. So for those of us in, in, in Christianity today who think God is done with Israel, not even close. God is almost done with the church. Israel, as we looked at the last time we were together, is, is the bride of Christ. Not the church. Replacement theology is just like the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Sidonians. It's false gods. It's false teaching. It, it, it... Wow, I, I'm, I should probably just quit and make this over because I got so far off what I wanted to say. I just might keep this anyways. I'm out of time. Um, I just want to encourage you to to you know make remarks or comments in you know Google or wherever. Uh, I've got to post this video. If I do, please comment. Please make remarks. You know, either agree with me or disagree. I, I don't care. Swear as much as you want. It's not going to hurt my feelings. The only thing I, I just ask that you please respectfully do not take the Lord's name in vain. But feel free to to say whatever you want about Christianity. And I hope maybe a lot of atheists and a lot of antagonists will, will, will vent, will rant, will rage against the church. So we have a chance to look at ourselves to see how badly we behave, how far away from the Bible we, we, we stray. And I hope that for those who aren't Christians, you know, you won't judge God by the merits of his people, that you would start to look at the Bible in, 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 a, in a new way and, and, and find a good Bible believing, God-honoring, spirit-led church. And by spirit-led, I don't mean like speaking in tongues, falling out in the aisle, and you know, and, you know throwing water at you, and, and breathing on you so everybody falls down. That's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. That's, that's, that's showmanship. You know? That's, that, that's all it is. It's Hollywood. It's, it's false teaching. I, 
I don't know. So, <laughs> Judges chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I hope I didn't scare you away, and I, and I hope you continue to follow along in the study. There's so much here in the book of, of Judges that it'll just blow your mind if you just slow down. Slow down. If you only get through two or three verses a day, then thank God. <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff here that you'll miss if you just look at it like uh, yeah, it's old and, and it, it has no record. It's Israel's history. It's not allegory. But it, it's there's a lot here, and I don't I don't not want to spiritualize anything. I don't want to you know make a you know uh, I don't want to make water you know, wine out of water. That's not my job. I just I'm weird. I, I look at things differently, and I hope I'm getting you to at least for the, if not for the first time to think for yourself, to to be bold enough, to be brave enough, to be to, to be numbered apart from those from false teaching, to to. Get out of that false church, that false system of religion. God doesn't want a religion. To obey is better than sacrifice. God wants He doesn't want sacrifices. He doesn't want burnt, you know, offerings. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. And I could talk about the Bible all day. The Bible says to, to offer up ourselves as, as a as a willing and holy sacrifice. Already have time. Gotta go. Study Judges. Hope you get something out of it.